Hi, Minister Houston. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. You just Thanks. returned this morning from the yes, UN, yes, so you're well-placed to, uh, to comment on some of what we just heard there. I, I, I wanted to start off, actually, by uh, asking you to reflect on the comments from President Zelensky, and, and I, especially where Russia's veto on the Security Council yeah. is concerned, and the prime, our own Prime Minister's comments would seem to echo some sympathy for that position. Do you agree that Russia's uh, ability to have a veto on the Security Council, especially at this juncture, makes no sense? Well, the Russians have not been responsible international players. They have engaged in illegal behavior and illegal invasion of Ukraine. They have committed war crimes in Ukraine. They have uh, used food as a weapon, energy as a weapon. They are destabilizing uh, many, many uh, societies, including the Global South. So uh, their actions have not been uh, the actions of a responsible Security Council member. So does that mean that they should not sit, in your view, on the Security Council? Well, these are conversations that, that should be had by, uh, by, by all UN members who get to have a say in the makeup of the United Nations. What we believe is that uh, Russia should be held accountable for its actions in Ukraine, its illegal invasion of Ukraine, its destruction of property, its killing of civilians, committing uh, crimes, uh, war crimes, and using food as a weapon, using energy as a weapon, which has not only impacted Ukraine, but Im impacted so many countries in the global south. You're seeing energy prices go up. You're seeing uh, food prices go up. It's putting a lot of people at risk. And you could draw a clear line, a direct line from those impacts uh, to, to, to the uh, actions of Russia in Ukraine. And that is why uh, we need to stay united and make sure that we support Ukraine to maintain its uh, independence and territorial integrity. And I certainly have some questions for you about what that support looks like. But sure. my initial question was very specific around whether or not Canada has yeah. a position on whether Russia should occupy a seat on the Security Council. You laid out all the reasons why yeah. that question is being asked, but you didn't specifically answer well, the question. Well, like I said, this is a conversation and a discussion uh, that should be had by, had by all members of the U U United Nations We don't family. have a position our own as a country, uh, though? We, we, we will continue to engage in, uh, in those conversations, but our focus is to support Ukraine at this difficult time, making sure that Ukraine can uh, regain its lost territories and, 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 and making sure that uh, Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine is not, uh, is not successful and, in fact, uh, that Russia must be stopped for uh, everything that they're doing in Ukraine and beyond. Are those efforts hampered, though, when a country like our own cannot unequivocally state that a country like Russia, given its behavior over the last 18 months, does not deserve a seat on a Well, like I said, th there haven't been a responsible international uh, 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 power that uh, has used uh, its different tools, whether it's diplomatic or, or military or economic even, and food, responsibly. They, they have not, and we, we have condemned their actions. And, uh, you know, President Zelensky's comments, uh, I think, uh, may spur discussion among uh, the, the family of the United Nations, the family of nations within the UN, and those are the discussions that will be had there. What, what I am reiterating is our position with respect to Russia and uh, the Russian Federation's destabilizing impacts uh, around the world, not just in Ukraine. And I've seen firsthand the impacts that that's having on the lives of people in the global south uh, in terms of uh, being food insecure and some of them even moving towards starvation. It is, it is really unacceptable that uh, Russia is using food as a weapon. I, I want to ask you about the role Canada will or does play in supporting you know, communities like the ones in the Global yep. South that you, yep. that you talk about, but, but communities and, and countries right across the world that yes. are suffering an enormous amount right now, not just because of food insecurity, yep. but the most number of displaced people that, right. that we've ever seen. Yep. And as, particularly in the context of Ukraine, I listened to the Prime Minister in that speech say, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be one or the other, right? We can He's still right. offer that support. We can and do still, both. We, we can, can do, do both. both. But yes. my question to you is yeah. that lots of aid organizations don't feel that your government is living up to the mandate it set out for itself when it comes to international aid. And by that I mean, in the last budget, for example, you held the line. You didn't see an increase, which you did promise in the 2015, uh, election, and then also reiterated in the last mandate letter to your predecessor in, in 2021. So there are questions among the aid community about your commitment as the need for aid grows. What do you say to those questions and those concerns? What I would say is look at our latest numbers. So the, the allocation that is contained in Budget 2023 is almost, almost $7 billion. That's a 49% increase from 2015. So we have, we have increased international development assistance. Of course, 2022 was an exceptional year. You, you saw 
uh, over $10 billion in, 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 in assistance and development, but that's because of the after effects of COVID as well as the exceptional circumstances that Ukraine found itself in. But even if you look at the numbers, as I said, for 2023, they represent an almost 50 percent increase from where we were in 2015. Second, in addition to the, to the uh, high numbers of, uh, of, of aid that we provide to, to many countries, uh, we're also doing everything that we can to leverage other dollars to also have a bigger impact with the finite dollars that we have. I've seen firsthand the difference that we're making on the ground in terms of empowering people to help themselves, uh, making sure that people have more capacity to do more for themselves and for their communities, not just for disaster uh, response, although that's important, not just in humanitarian response, although that's important, but also on socioeconomic development. When you are able to empower people to, uh, to, to do better economically and socially, uh, not just for themselves but for their communities, it is, it is better for us because then there's sustainable development and we can move on to another vulnerable population. I've seen firsthand what we are doing in, in places like Colombia and Kenya and Zambia where we are contributing to a revolution in agriculture. So we're having higher yields, we're introducing drought resistant crops, we are uh, enabling women and young people to uh, to use agriculture as a, not just as a career but as an economic development tool. Canada is doing all of that in addition to, of course, the humanitarian response which we'll, we'll, we'll continue to engage in. And, and I'm certainly not trying to take away from yeah. all of that you just spelled out, but I also have interviewed many different or aid mm -hmm. organizations who had expected more from your government. Mm -hmm. I take your point that 2022 was an outsized year, but yeah. even when you contrast that mm -hmm. with, for example, the SDG, the Sustainable Development yes. Goals, yeah. It's 0.37% of GNI. The Sustainable mm -hmm. Development Goal by 2030 is 0.7%. Right. You would have to spend a lot more money mm -hmm. over the next six yeah. years to reach that. Are you going to at least fulfill the promise that you made back in 2015 and continue to increase spending each year, or do you plan to continue holding the line like you did last well, year? Well, if, if you know past histories and indication of future behavior, we have we have increased. Uh, from, do you intend to do that from, even from in this fiscal environment? Uh, those are discussions that are ongoing. What I can tell you is the numbers contained in the 2023 budget, the allocation for international assistance and development, represent a 49% increase from the numbers in 2015. That I know, is but what fact. you promised is to increase it every year. The, the, well, we have, even this year, but because you're looking at last year uh, being higher, yes, but that was an exceptional year dealing with Ukraine and dealing with the, uh, the impacts of COVID, which haven't completely gone away, which is why you're seeing uh, you know, a substantial uh, allocation for, the, for 2023. And we'll, we'll continue to, of course, listen to the sector. They are, they are the experts. They have the, the history of, of doing amazing work on behalf of Canadians in the global south and beyond. And so I'll continue to engage with them, listen to them, and also find other ways to stretch our dollars, to uh, attract private sector investment in this space, to attract foundations in this space. And uh, our work in international development also is, is about that. It's not just about Canadian government dollars, but also how do we incentivize private sector to come in and how do we incentivize foundations to join us to increase the impacts of what we're already doing that's amazing on the ground. Okay, I have to leave it there. I'm out of time. Okay. I appreciate your time as always, Minister. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thanks in for having me. International appreciate. Development Minister Ahmed.